It's February 4th, 2003, and it's the night before Sophia Juarez's fifth birthday. Like any kid on their birthday eve, she is so excited. That evening, she was playing with her brother in her room. There are differing accounts of what happened next, but at some point, Sophia left the home and simply disappeared. Despite an extensive search and publicity, no trace was found of the little girl. Investigators never gave up, though, and now, 18 years after Sophia was last seen, there have been several new leads in this case, and one that could possibly change everything. And of all places, this explosive new clue came from TikTok. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Sophia Juarez. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is, and then they were gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. I really wanted to get this story out there as soon as possible because, as I mentioned in the intro, there have been some exciting new leads in this case, and it is possibly closer to being solved than it ever has been before. Because of TikTok? Partially, yes. Okay. I know. But before we get into the case of Sophia Juarez, I want to first give a huge shout out to our newest supporter on Patreon, Marie R. So thank you so much for joining us on Patreon, Marie. It really, really means the world to us. Thank you so much. And just a note for those of you who are already there or are thinking about joining us, we don't have a ton of bonus content up yet, full disclosure, but we are actively working on increasing that. It's just really a matter of the fact that this is not our full-time job and so we're doing the best we can. I promise. I'm trying. (laughs) (laughs) But we are trying to get up more as, you know, as soon as humanly possible. But we were, however, just able to start Ethan's mini show. Yeah, it's called Unplugged from the Darkness. Yeah. It's a little check-in on Mondays to uh, kind of step away from the true crime and talk about some mental health issues. Yep. So the first one is up on our Patreon now for everybody, $5 and up. And we are going to be posting them weekly on Mondays, like you said. So if you'd like to check it out, please visit us at patreon.com slash ATTWG pod. Now let's get to the story of Sophia Juarez. Sophia Lucerno Juarez was born on February 5th, 1998 to Maria Juarez Maria was a teenager when she became pregnant with Sophia and didn't have a relationship with her daughter's father. Maria was around 16 when Sophia was born, but she came from a tight-knit family. The Juarez family was originally from Mexico, but they had mainly lived in California, and I do believe that's where Sophia was born. But at some point, the family moved to Kennewick, Washington, and Maria and Sophia came to join them around 2001. Maria, Sophia, and Sophia's younger brother lived in a home with Maria's mother, Ignacia Juarez, Ignacia's boyfriend, Jose Torres, and six aunts and uncles, as well as various cousins. So crowded house. Yeah, very packed house. So, what you I'm sorry, you said Sophia's little brother? Yes. So, Sophia had a little brother. And is, uh, his dad in the picture? I do not know. I couldn't find anything about his father. Okay. Now, I've read various accounts of what happened next, with some saying that Sophia simply slipped out of the house without anyone knowing, but it doesn't seem like that's actually the case. Based on articles that came out at the time of her disappearance, it seems as though Ignacia's boyfriend, Jose, he who was basically like a grandfather right. to the kids. yeah. Around 8.30 that night, he asked if any of them wanted to go to the store with him. He had to, like, pick up milk and get gas, just, you know, going. It was literally just going to the convenience store down the street. Okay. None of the kids said that they did, but apparently Sophia changed her mind at the last minute. She went into her mother's room to ask her, and her mother gave her a dollar to get a treat at the store. 
So with the dollar in her pocket, Sophia left the house after Jose. So I'm sorry, did you say Jose was, was driving to the convenience store or walking? Uh, yeah, he uh, was driving because he had to go get gas. Right, okay. But it was like right down the street. So it's, it's something that was within walking distance, but he was driving because he had to get gas. So four-year-old little girl walks down the street. Right. And well, but that wasn't the plan, right? Like Maria thought that Jose was like still out there and she was just literally going outside to get him. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, we have kids and we know that getting them out of the house isn't as simple as just giving them a dollar and sending them on their way. Like this was 830 at night. So, and Sophia was playing. So she almost certainly didn't have shoes on. Right. Yeah. And who knows if she was even dressed? Like she could have been in pajamas. Yeah, she could have been she, ready for bed. Exactly. So who knows? So I'm sure Maria had to get her ready to some extent. When Sophia left the house, she was wearing blue overalls, a red shirt, and white Converse sneakers. And Maria reportedly did see Sophia leave, but what she didn't know is that Jose was already gone. Okay. And Jose didn't realize that Sophia had changed her mind. So when none of the kids initially took him up on his offer, like he just left. Mm -hmm. And Sophia took too long to catch up with him. But instead of coming back inside and saying that she had missed him, it seems as though Sophia took it upon herself to catch up up with him at the store. The convenience store where Jose was going was, like I said, pretty close to the house, but he did need gas, so he had to drive. And Sophia was a day before five, so she clearly wasn't going to catch up to him when he's in his car. Right. So Jose continued on his way, blissfully unaware of what was happening. He went to the store, filled up his tank, got his milk, and then used the payphone to make a call to Mexico. Mm. So, like, he just took his time, you know? He Because well, sure, none didn't... of the kids were with him. Yeah. So he didn't have to like listen to them complaining. So he's like, I'm just going to go out. I'm going to make a call, you know, whatever. And it must have been a pretty long call because he didn't return to the house until about an hour later. It was then that the entire family realized that something was horribly wrong. When Maria realized that Sophia wasn't with Jose and that she wasn't in the house, she, of course, panicked. Yeah. She quickly called the police, who arrived three minutes later. Wow. Yeah. It was cold that night, only about 36 degrees. So that, combined with the late hour and Sophia's young age, the Kennewick Police Department did not waste any time thinking she was, like, hiding or playing outside somewhere. Good. I mean, good good response. Right, right, right. (laughs) Three officers initially responded to the home. One interviewed Maria, while the other two searched inside and outside. When they didn't find her immediately, they called in additional officers. Another half dozen or so showed up, and they started searching the neighborhood. Eventually, the search radius was increased to three miles, and over the next day or so, hundreds of police officers and firefighters from different local agencies joined in on the search. That's impressive. That's that's an awesome response. Yeah, absolutely. An Amber Alert was also issued, making it the first time that it happened in Washington State. Really? Yeah. So, th- yeah, this was 2003. I mean, Amber Alerts haven't been around forever. Oh, that's interesting, though. Yeah, so it was very new at the time, and that was the very first one. When Sophia didn't turn up that night, investigators were pretty convinced that they were dealing with a child abduction. Mm-hmm. What they didn't know was if it was a stranger abduction or or far more common family abduction. Right. I'm sure their their attention focused to Jose right away. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, there are many adults living in the house. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it focused I'm sure on, they didn't rule out anybody, but, you know, the, the prime suspect in my mind at this point in the story would be Jose. Yeah. Just because you know, he was the one that was out of the house. Right. No. And I think that makes complete sense. And I'm sure that's exactly what they were thinking as well, but they didn't just focus in on the people in the house. And this is the one thing that I will say about this investigation. Like it seems that the police have always done a good job of 
exploring all the different avenues kind of simultaneously. Like, I don't see any point in this where they get tunnel vision and they're just like only going in one direction. Good. That's yeah. Awesome. No, it really is. So obviously, yes, they were concentrating on the people in the house. But within two days, police located Sophia's father, a man named Andre Gutierrez Abrahan, so they could interview him and see if he had anything to do with Sophia's disappearance. And where was he living at the time? Because wasn't he in California? In California, yeah, but he actually was in Washington State at the time, nearby, like couch surfing, basically. Hmm. Yeah. But when they found Andre to interview him, he said that he hadn't had any contact with Maria or Sophia because he didn't think Sophia was actually his. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's the big reason why he was in his life. Like when Maria got pregnant, he was like, yeah, that's not my baby. Huh. So yeah, he's like, yeah, I have not talked to her since. Never met Sophia. Don't know anything about her. Okay. But like I said, he was in the general area. So police had to look at oh, him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You I mean, know? He, he, yeah. In my mind, he's he's still a suspect. Just oh, because for he sure. says he doesn't, it didn't have contact, like, that doesn't mean anything. Right. But he even took a polygraph, and he passed that. And so eventually he was ruled out just because, again, like, they couldn't find any proof that he had anything to do with it. No motive. Sure. Yeah. Maybe he had an alibi, too. Who knows? Right. The local media covered this case pretty extensively, and I was lucky enough to find several articles from the first days and weeks of the investigation. So we're able to get a pretty good picture of what police were doing to find Sophia. On February 6th, which is two days after her disappearance, another search was done of Sophia's neighborhood and the surrounding area, including a wooded area. There were around 250 searchers, and they brought in dogs to assist. According to an article in the Tri-City Herald that was first published on February 7th, 2003, in addition to polygraphing Andre Abrahan, Jose Torres, Sophia's grandmother's boyfriend, was also given a polygraph and passed. Sophia's mother, Maria, had also agreed to take one, um, but she hadn't by the time that article was published, but she was in line to take one. But they didn't just rely on that. They also went to the store, you know, they checked out his alibi and he verified that Jose actually bought milk that night and they were working on verifying that call he made to Mexico. Uh, they also impounded his car. Uh, yeah, you're, you weren't kidding. This, this is a thorough investigation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It does seem as though Kennewick police did a good job of leading a bifurcated investigation. While they were looking into Sophia's family, they also started looking at sex offenders in the area. According to that same Tri-City Herald article, there were 151 level 1 offenders, 10 level 2 offenders, and 6 level 3 offenders in Kennewick. So what what do the different levels mean? The levels of um, sex offenders are like burns, so first degree is less serious than third degree. Okay. Uh, Level one, the vast majority of sex offenders are level one offenders, and they're considered at a low risk to reoffend. So, like maybe they're first time offenders, or you know, it's something relatively minor. Okay. Level two offenders have a moderate risk of reoffending. So generally, there's like more than one victim, and or the abuse was long term. Gotcha. And then level three, as you may guess, are offenders that are considered to have a high risk to reoffend. So they have one or more victims and may have committed other acts of violence. You know, this is basically all the rest. So they may know their victims, they may not know their victims. Like it's the worst bunch. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it also says these offenders commonly have clear indications of a personality disorder. Which sure, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there are six of those level three offenders that lived nearby. They also did some very interesting searches of three different homes in the area. By this time, Kennewick police had gotten state and federal agencies involved, and they served three search warrants on February 8th. So again, four days later. Hmm. These homes, nor the people who lived there, were connected to the Juarez family, 
but police felt strongly that they could have been part of a crime scene as another Tri-City Herald article describes federal agents in yellow suits and dogs that were described by police sergeant Brian Swartzwalter as, quote, not the kind you send out after bad guys, end quote. She said yellow suits, uh-huh. like like Tyvex that's, ke- chem suits. That's what I'm guessing, yeah. So meth? Oh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Typically wouldn't wear suits like that if if it was cocaine or something like that. Meth ha- involves a lot of other chemicals, which right. is why you would put on those suits. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's just the article just said that they had on those suits. They didn't go into why, and obviously the police weren't going to like go into why. Sure. But with the dogs being not the kind you send out after bad guys, I take that to mean cadaver dogs. Mm. But I guess maybe it was drug sniffing dogs too. Or, I mean, not too. I feel like they probably do one or the other. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so canines are very yeah, specific. specialized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, specialized in one area and one area only. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could it could have been a bomb bomb dogs. Yeah. You don't send those after bad guys. Typically, bomb dogs are very docile. Sure, so. but I don't think that. I mean, I could give. I could say drug dogs, maybe, but like not bomb dogs in this scenario. That doesn't make sense. I think yeah. maybe a drug dog, but. To me, I think a cadaver dog is more likely because yeah. honestly, I do think they were looking for a body at this point. Or just not rolling that out. Right. Yeah. During the investigation, police impounded a van from one of the properties. They also brought a locksmith in to search the trunks of several other cars at the homes. So, why these homes? Well, according to one of the homeowners, it was a witch hunt. Okay. Catalana Katie Vargas told the Tri-City Herald the day after the search, which included her home, quote, I am innocent. My boys are innocent. I don't know the Horace family, end quote. And because she had two teenage sons Uh who lived with her. The other two homes that were searched belonged to her family members, and both of her high school-aged sons were taken in for questioning. So I'm I'm waiting to hear the connection did, did they li- you said they lived close by yeah but the horace family did not know them and they did not know the Horace family okay yeah the scrutiny probably had something to do with katie's other son jeremy sagastigui on november 19th 1995 when jeremy was 25 years old he was babysitting for a friend melissa sarbacher He was watching her two children, a one-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy named Keevan Sarbacher. At some point during the evening, he sexually assaulted, beat, stabbed, and drowned little Keevan. Jesus Christ. He then waited for Melissa to come home, and when she did, he shot her and her friend who was with her, a woman named Lisa Vera Acevedo. Both women died. Melissa's one-year-old daughter was unharmed. Jeremy Sagastigui was eventually convicted of three counts of aggravated first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death and didn't fight his execution. His mother, Katie, the one who we were talking about, attempted to fight it on his behalf, but her efforts didn't work. Jeremy died by lethal injection on October 13, 1998. Okay, so they're targeting the family because of because of the older son. That's what I thought when I was reading through all of this. Because that is, and that's not even a connection, obviously, but that is the only reason I could think of why they were targeting this family. But keep this story in mind because this comes back later. Okay. Despite extensive searches of these homes and property, no trace of Sophia was found in any of them. But the police still had other clues. On February 11th, police told the Tri-City Herald that they were looking for the driver of a van that was seen at Washington Street and 14th Avenue, which was on Sophia's route from her home to the store, around the time she disappeared. This van, which was described as a silver or light blue mid-1980s panel van with no windows. It was like a painter's van or a contractor's van, but police were sure to clarify that it wasn't necessarily 
actually a painter or a contractor's van. It's yeah, just, yeah. that's just that's like just what a it general looked description like. of it. Yeah. yeah. The van sighting coincides with witness reports of a teenage Hispanic male and a young Hispanic girl in the same vicinity. Police also arrested a man named Kevin Ireland in relation to Sophia's disappearance. His wife told police that he had called her and made some weird comments about Sophia. So they searched his home, questioned him, took DNA, but there was never anything to make him a suspect. So he remained simply a person of interest who is more than likely just a creep. Yeah. And completely unrelated to this case. So when he was arrested, like he was eventually charged with telephone harassment. Uh, just because I was like the only, they obviously were pissed and wanted to charge him with something. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, that stuff like that takes the the investigation and you know it, it, it pulls it, focus. Yeah, it, it pulls focus and it pulls resources. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. So yeah, I think they were pissed and yeah. they're like telephone harassment, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Though police were running down every lead, they unfortunately just started to dry up. By February 13th, police said they were finished searching the neighborhood. Sergeant Randy Maynard told reporters, quote, I know some people in the community are starting to get critical. I can't say that I wouldn't be the same. I want them to understand as a department, this is our entire focus, end quote. And honestly, surprisingly, I believe him. You know. Stark contrast from some of the other cases we've had where they said it was their entire focus. And yeah. Then, hey, Barry like, Police Department. Uh, well, you know, um, well. Yeah. No, I, I really do believe him because when I was doing the research and going through the years of this case, Sergeant Randy Maynard keeps on reappearing in it and his title changes. <laughs> like, So I think I've got, I refer to him as like three or four different ranks okay. uh, throughout this because he's climbing up the ranks in the department, but he is a constant presence in this case. Good. Even though they were finished searching the neighborhood, they still had around 20 investigators working on the case, including some from the FBI. They were still treating this as a missing persons case, but admitted that time wasn't on their side. Right. By February 15th, 11 days after Sophia was last seen, searches turned to nearby Columbia River. Members of the Columbia Basin Dive Rescue began searching the shoreline and wading through shallow areas. They even brought in dogs and a Washington Army National Guard helicopter. Over the next several weeks, Sophia's case started to gain national momentum. She was featured on America's Most Wanted and NASCAR driver Damon Lusk, who graduated high school in Kennewick, raced the Bush series with a photo of Sophia on the trunk of his car. Wow. Yeah, in lieu of a sponsor logo. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. And while those efforts did result in phone calls, they didn't result in any solid leads. Detectives seemed to be incredibly invested in solving this case, but eventually they're just wasn't any more that they could do with what they had. As time went on, there were a few unconfirmed sightings, like the 10-year-old neighbor who claimed to see Sophia walk down the driveway and talk to a man in all black. There was the drug informant who told authorities that they could find Sophia's body on a farm. In May of 2003, three months after her abduction, police started searching for an orange van with double J's in the license plate number. The driver of that was reported to be a white male between the ages of 35 and 40 with a thick blonde beard. But that connection was tenuous at best. Witnesses had basically just reported seeing that van generally in the vicinity at generally the time of her disappearance. But there was nothing else that indicated that it had anything to do with her case. What color did you say that van was? Orange. Yeah, that's... That's definitely different than the other van. Yeah, yeah. So the other van was like a blue, gray, silver type van. Yeah. Interestingly, or almost unbelievably, investigators still thought Sophia was alive even eight years later. Kennewick Police Detective Sergeant Randy Maynard, who I mentioned just a few minutes ago, who he was one of the original officers, told the Tri-City Herald in 2011, quote, my gut is that she's alive. If she's deceased, we'd have found her remains. Maybe that's hanging on to hope. I don't know. End quote. 
I mean, it's, it's confidence in your, you know, searching ability for the, for a body. It is, especially in Washington state. Because again, right. so this We've is our second, cases. Yeah. well, just last week's on Lo- Logan Schindelman. Yeah, didn't we have another one that... Yeah, Kyron Horman. And yeah. Yeah. So... Lots of trees in Washington. Right. Right. But they did not think that they had missed her. No, I mean, good for them, and maybe they didn't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I mean, again, like, maybe he really is just hanging on to hope, but it's nice to have an investigator on a case like this that is hanging on to that hope. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because he, if, if he's hanging on to that hope, he's going to drive the, that investigation forward. Absolutely. Instead of just waiting for the, not to sound cruel, just waiting for a body to turn up. Right, right. And, you know, so this quote was in 2011, you know, so eight years after she disappeared. Yeah. And he was still doing it. Like, he was still running down leads. Someone contacted them right around that time saying that there was a Sofia Juarez on Facebook who was living in Long Beach, California. Well, so, I mean, well, I know, sure, but I mean, but the they name still, Sofia Juarez, like that's not, it's a very common name, yeah. But they still ran her down and like checked it out, they didn't just ignore it, yeah. No, that's that, that's good, yeah. On the 10th anniversary of her abduction, police said that Sophia's disappearance had basically reached urban legend status. There were just rumors, you know, swirling around about what had happened to her. One was that she had been accidentally hit by a van and then buried. That one apparently came up a lot. Another was that she was abducted by someone she knew and was living in Mexico. Uh, Slightly more plausible, but aren't all of her... Or most of her relatives, right there within the United. Well, yeah, in the house. It sounds like basically like, in the house. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah, and I, I'm sure they do still have family back in Mexico because sure. you know Jose was calling Mexico. He's not in her family, but you know, Cl- either way, enough. I'm sure they still have connections. But yeah, you're I right. Feel like there's not really much of an import business into Mexico. I feel like most of it's coming out of Mexico. Hey, I don't know. I mean, I mean I don't know, people but... people do things all the time. Sure. But yeah, I mean, because you got to think just in that house, Sophia was living with her mother, her brother, you know, and all of her mother's six siblings yeah. and her grandma. And apparently, so Jose, you know, was Ignacia's boyfriend, but... Um, Sophia's biological grandfather also lived nearby and like apparently came out and, you know, joined in the search and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, like her family was very close and they were all there basically. Right. I don't put a whole lot of stock in the, uh, getting hit by a van and then buried. Cause yeah. it, the, I mean, how many witnesses were around at the time? It seemed, it seemed like they got a lot of witness statements. Well, yeah, they got several witness statements. Yeah, the the van thing, and it was never a witness who saw it. It was more like, oh, I heard that. No, yeah, no, I understand that. I'm just saying, like, you have witnesses that can identify seeing the gray van. Right. You know, possibly with Sophia in it, right? You said it was a Hispanic male with a young Hispanic girl? Yeah, but the information that was given at the time... Mm -hmm didn't necessarily connect those two. It didn't necessarily say that that was Sophia at all. Okay. And it didn't necessarily connect them to the van. Like they're, they didn't say like, Oh yeah, there are these two people. We saw them getting into the van. It just said there are these two people. There's also a van. Okay. Okay. Well, regardless, you're getting witness statements about various things that were, that were happening at the time in that general area. And given that it was, a short distance, relatively speaking, between the house and the store. Like, if she had gotten hit, I by feel like a van, somebody would have like noticed somebody something. Would have said that, yes. yeah, yeah, because right. we're not talking about like a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. My yeah, point. I mean, yes. this is a neighborhood; it's a street. Like, right. somebody would have seen something. Yeah. Eventually, the Juarez family moved back to California and tried to pick up the pieces. Sophia's mother, Maria, had another child, a baby boy and got married in 2008. But the next year, tragedy would strike again. 
Maria Juarez passed away from medical complications in 2009. She was just 26 years old. Whoa. She died never knowing what happened to her only daughter. Her ashes were returned to Washington and spread from the corner of 15th Avenue and Washington Street, where Sophia was last seen, to St. Joseph's Catholic Church, where they held a mass for her. Even with Maria gone, Kennewick police stayed in touch with the rest of the Horas family and continued searching for the missing girl. And to be completely honest, it looked like no one would ever know what happened to Sophia at this point. Year after year went by, and despite some anniversary articles and kind of, you know, weak leads, the case just got colder and colder. That is, until 2021. February 4th, 2021 was the 18th anniversary of Sophia's disappearance. To mark this occasion, Kennewick police, who are still haunted by this unsolved case, enlisted the help of a Washington State Patrol program. The Homeward Bound program's goal is to bring attention to missing children by posting their photos and information on the sides of tractor trailers. This way, there is literally a rolling billboard that goes across the country and into Canada and Mexico putting these faces in front of potential witnesses. That's an excellent program. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, So at the time, in February, um, Sophia was the fifth child to be, um, that was being featured, like, at the time, and they were going up to 10, basically 10 at a time that were going around the country. Police say that they received several calls and possible leads from this event, but their biggest lead would come a few months later, from an unlikely source. TikTok. Now we're at TikTok. Uh. Now this is an absolutely bonkers part of the story. So there's this random social media personality in Mexico who posts a bunch of videos on TikTok where he interviews people in the street and he posts on, he posts on YouTube as well. So I watched several of them and while I don't really know what they're saying, they seem like lighthearted and fun, just kind of man on the street type things. Okay. So his name is Ozbala on TikTok and Oz, O-Z-Z, on YouTube. But he posted the video in question on the Aka i Ala TikTok account. So I know I'm already losing you with the social media talk. Yeah, I, I, I know YouTube. But in any case, I promise this is worth it. So just okay. hang in there. Uh, I'm, I'm right there. Tick, All right. TikTok. TikTok. So this guy went down to the town plaza in Culiacan, Sinaloa. Culiacan is the largest city in Sinaloa, which is in northwestern Mexico. So he's just doing his thing, talking to people when he starts interviewing this young woman who's sitting in the plaza. The woman said she was homeless, but then says that she was kidnapped as a young child. Quote, the truth is, I don't know where I'm from, end quote, she said in Spanish. She went on to say that she wanted her grandmother and her grandfather to come find her and that she doesn't like birthdays. You gotta be shitting me. I know. Come on, really? Yes, because remember, Sophia was kidnapped the night before her birthday. The woman in Khan said that she's 22. Sophia would have been 23. So the guy posted this, and I'm sure just thinking it was like a weird thing, but not thinking too much deeper. He did actually apparently post another video that like was, that did kind of break from his persona where he was like, hey, like, why don't we help this girl get back to her family? Yeah. And then commenters were like, wait a second. Like, that looks like Sophia Juarez. And so I'm going to show you a photo of Sophia when she was little before she di- she disappeared. Okay. Show you the age progressed photos of her. And then I'll show you this woman and okay. just see what you think. Because okay. again, you're better with faces than I am. <laughs> All right. So this is a picture of Sophia. Uh my God, that's an adorable picture. I know. <laughs> Isn't she the cutest little girl ever? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
All right. So let me show you one of the age progressed photos of her. All right. So this is the most recent age progressed photo. Okay. And I'll show you the two side by side. Okay. So what do you think about the age progression? It's hard to to say, judging from that one picture. I I'm, I can't imagine that they only had that one picture right, to go with right, the age progression, because the she's got a like a quirky smile <laughs> I in, know. in the the the, little the actual photo, picture. Yeah. Again, I can't imagine that was how she normally smiled. Right, right. So you know. All right. Well, so let me show you the picture of the woman from the plaza in Mexico. Okay, so this is a screenshot from the video. Mm, okay. Um, nose looks different. See, to me, let me see if I can find a side-by-side, because -side, to me, I thought the noses were actually pretty similar. Okay, so here are the two side-by-side. -side. And this is that first picture I showed you of Sophia in a screen grab of the woman in Mexico. That looks... Yeah, I mean... That looks more like the actual child picture of Sophia than the age progression. Yeah. The, the age progression makes the nose look different. Right. Yeah, but to me, I, I feel like the noses in those two photos look similar. They do. And they it's, look it's, similar. It's tough, of course, because, you know, you've got however many years. Right. Um, 18. Yeah. She's so young, it's hard to tell bone structure. Yeah, exactly, because kids don't have yeah. bones. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, at four, she just has a, a pudgy round face. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So the the curves around her mouth, she has a unique curve on, I guess, that's, that would be the right side of her face, mm -hmm. where it goes from... As she's smiling, nose, and then right around the corner of her mouth, it looks like there's, it, it like juts out in a weird way. Mm. And that's actually present in both pictures, along with a slight dimple on the left side of the cheek. What I'm looking at as far as... Oh, yeah, I see that. You uh -huh. see that? Well, I for in the picture of the woman, though, I couldn't tell if that's like a shadow or really what that was. Uh, I mean... At first, when I saw that, I thought that maybe that was just like dirt. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought or too. A shadow, but I mean, looking at the at at that's that's a unique feature. So right. it would be odd that she happened that to have like a smudge in the at same the place, exact same location. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that looks a lot like the actual picture, not necessarily the age progression. Because the age right. progression, the nose looked a little different. But again, you know, I, I don't know how many references or uh, uh, or source material they had for the age progression. Right. This does look a lot like her. And again, the slight dimple on the other side of the cheek. Shape of the eyes is right. Yeah, I mean, it looks a lot like her. Yeah, you're right. I, I I'm noticing the dimple now, which is not something that I noticed. Well, it's Before. it's very slight. In it her, is. In her, it is in a, in her baby picture, but it's but it is there. And yeah, you know, you get older, you lose some of the some of the, the chubbiness of the cheeks, and the mm -hmm. dimple becomes more prevalent. Yeah, and the lips too, because they both have a thinner upper lip and a fuller bottom lip. Right. That one feature on the right side. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be curious to see more pictures of. The woman, of the, the older plaza. woman on the yeah. plaza, to see if that if that feature. Well, what I will say is shows that up again. in every single screenshot that I've seen, you can see it. So I don't know. I mean, it, it that could be a scar on her face. The older, right. the the woman. Yeah. Uh, it it could have been dirt. I don't know. But from what I've seen, it, again, it's 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 a unique characteristic of her as a child, and it would be. <laughs> A crazy circumstance that right. this woman who is basically describing what happened to Sophia to have a mark in that same location. Yeah. Or a scar in that same location. Yeah. I mean, nothing surprises me really at this point, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I've said it before. I don't believe in coincidence. I do. <laughs> I know you do. I don't. I do not. Yeah. So once this 
whole thing started gaining steam, people began to contact police, both in Kennewick and Culiacan. The guy who made the video was cooperative and took local authorities back to the town plaza where he met the woman, but they haven't been able to locate her. However, after further investigation, it sounds like she might currently be in rehab. Mm. She also talked about having issues with drug addiction in the video. That was one of the other things she touched on. The woman's family apparently also has been contacted about the video. Like, I think just not by police, but not necessarily, but by somebody who saw it. And they're like, no, we did not kidnap her. Like, please stop. Okay, so so, so somebody knows this woman's actual family or supposed family? Yeah, so apparently somebody who saw the video was like, oh, that's like so-and-so's daughter or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they got linked back to her family in Mexico and they're like, no, she's not kidnapped. Please stop publicizing this. Leave us alone. But police aren't just like taking their word for it. So they are still investigating. Like I said, she might be in rehab and I think that's making things difficult. But they're hoping to track her down, speak with her face to face, and then hopefully get her to agree to give a DNA sample because they do have Sophia's DNA on file. Oh, and and they so what I read did say Sophia's DNA at the very least they have familial DNA. Yes, uh, yeah, you know, especially because of how cooperative the the family's been. Exactly. Yeah. So they definitely did take DNA. They have DNA in this case, so they can very easily figure out once and for all if, if this woman or not. is her. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that's crazy. So it's really just a matter of finding her and hoping she agrees because like they can't compel her to give up her DNA. Sure. I mean, you can, <laughs> what, what was the case? The, the coffee shop diner. Yeah. Chili's man. Uh, Chili's, Take her to it, Chili's. Yeah. <laughs> Get I mean, some there, DNA there, that there way. There are ways you can. Get oh no, DNA. for sure. Like they could go about it, but yeah, I'm just saying yeah. like they can't legally force oh, no, no, her no, no, to no. give DNA. Right. So yeah, so that's and this all has to be done, of course, with the cooperation of the the local uh, yeah police the lo- in Mexico. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So we're talking, yeah, many jurisdictions. It's it, it it's going to be a thing. So I don't think this is necessarily going to get figured out, ex- especially soon. It's, you know, because this was in this has already been going on for uh, almost two months, I think, by now, mm-hmm. and we still don't have any definitive answers. So you know, it's it's a process. Yeah. But that's not all that's happened recently. Are we going to get back to that family now? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm so I still have like so many questions about that. So well, no, and so I didn't because I I try when I'm researching these I like obviously if you type in Sophia Juarez it's TikTok 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 yeah but when I'm actually reading, I try to read as chronologically as possible. Oh, you mean you don't want to flip to the last page of the book? (laughs) I try not to. (laughs) I mean, like I knew, I mean, obviously like when I went into this, I knew going into it that that, there is no last page of the book. Well, no, sure. Yes. Very philosophical, but, um, no, I mean, I knew that there was this TikTok possible sighting. So I knew that going into it, but I didn't like read any of the articles. I didn't watch the video. I didn't do any of that. I just kind of started at the beginning and went through it. And like I said, I was able to find all those contemporaneous articles. Mm -hmm. So I was really able to get a timeline of the investigation, which we can't always do. Yeah, for sure. Um, So that's what I tried to do. And so again, when I'm reading about this family and reading about like, how they did they executed all of these search warrants and they had federal agencies involved in these search warrants the the son and and the papers at the time the only thing that they could figure out was the the son who had been sentenced to death mm-hmm. and so they're like well it, i guess it has something to do with that like nobody else could figure anything else out at the time but now again we're coming back okay So the TikTok video obviously generated a lot of new press 
in the case, like I said. And Kennewick police wanted to capitalize on the renewed interest in Sophia's disappearance. So they released some bombshell information that they had been sitting on since 2003. Okay. This information is in the form of a witness account that came the day after Sophia's abduction. The headline on an article, just like to give you an idea of like how like much of a bomb the police dropped. The headline on the article that appeared in the Tri-City Herald on June 2nd, 2021 reads, quote, After 18 years, detectives say they know how a Tri-City's five-year-old disappeared. End quote. Like, that's a pretty bold-ass statement. Yeah. <laughs> the article goes on to say that the key player in Sophia's abduction was another child. Hmm. The day after Sophia's kidnapping on February 5th, 2003, her birthday, the witness saw her photo all over the news and believed that they had seen her being abducted. Okay. According to this witness statement, around 8.30 p.m. on February 4th, a young Hispanic boy, estimated to be between 11 and 14 years old, approached Sophia on the eastern sidewalk along South Washington Street between East 14th and 15th Avenues. He allegedly led her to a waiting van. Sophia was crying and the boy was laughing. The witness went on to say that the van was stopped on 14th Street facing west as if it was going to turn on to Washington, but it didn't. So this person, the witness, was stopped at a stop sign and kind of saw this, but they didn't really know what they were witnessing. Yeah, sure. I mean, they didn't know if that was the boy's younger sister or what. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then when they saw the news the next day, they were like, holy yeah, shit. Everything got pieced together. Sure. <laughs> yeah. The boy was further described as being between five feet tall and five foot two and having a light complexion. He was described as chubby and having a baby face and hands large for someone his age. He had dark, short, wavy hair that was greased down flat with product. He had bangs. The van in question was that panel van. So that blue, mm -hmm. gray, whatever panel van. So immediately in 2003, police released the information about the van, but did not release the information about the child. And the reason, so they say in this like new article, now that they, you know, released that they said that the reason they didn't was because of the ongoing investigation involving persons of interest. Gotcha. Which to me sounds like that family. And that's why they were looking so hard at the family. One, because of the older brother having, you know, had a very similar violent crime in his past and the fact that she had two high school aged sons so is there anything more definitive linking that uh witness statement to the family well i don't know to if that family that was investigated right for the vargas family so i don't know of anything more than that that could have been all it is it could not have been there could have been more but it seems as though that the vargas boys were ruled out, I guess, or, you know, they, cause I don't think anything really came of those searches. Right. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the police got this tip the day after her disappearance, it led them down the path to the Vargas boys that ended up not turning up anything. So they still didn't want, you know, they, I don't know if they were still kind of keeping an eye on them or, or what, but I think that's what led him down there. It didn't end up going that way. And so... They didn't, yeah, they didn't want to show their hand in case. Right. But I still think that police at that time, when they went searching the Vargas homes, that they were looking at it from a homicide angle, mm -hmm. which obviously doesn't fit with the woman in Mexico, right? I mean, it's kind of one or the other. Either it was a kidnapping and a homicide or a kidnapping and she's off living somewhere. Right. I am still really interested in this woman in Mexico, regardless of how insane <laughs> that would be. Because as I briefly mentioned earlier, Sophia being kidnapped and taken to Mexico was a rumor that had been around for years. Right. 
And back in February, before the sighting happened, Commander Randy Maynard. Oh, Commander now. Yeah, wow. yeah. Of course, he's the one who told the Herald back in 2011 that he thought Sophia was still alive, was interviewed on the podcast Washed Away. And again, this is back in February before anybody knew about this lady in Mexico. On it, he discussed, you know, a bunch of the different rumors, including the Mexico rumor, saying, quote, there was a concern raised by somebody, not in our department or not as part of the investigation, but somebody with a connection to the family that, excuse me, Sophia's mother had some developmental delays, and there was some concern levied somewhere that Sophia was not being raised uh, as someone desired that she should be. And the premise was that she was uh, she was taken from her mother and sent to live with relatives or someone else uh, in Mexico in order to be raised in either a more traditional culture environment or whatever the reasoning was, end quote. Yeah, and so... That's interesting considering, uh, again, as we discussed, like, it seemed like Sophia's entire family was in the area. Right. So... But, I mean, her entire immediate family, I mean, who knows? We're talking cousins, like, we're talking her paternal grandfather's family. Like, this is all her paternal grandmother's family, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows? But again, just so we're clear with all this in our head, this interview was around February of 2021. The TikTok video was in May of 2021. And the police released the information about the witness who saw the kid leading Sophia to a van in June of 2021. So whether this woman in Mexico is or is in Sophia, it could still fit. Like the whole kid leading her away into oh, the yeah, van. Sure. Probably not with the Vargas family again, because there isn't yeah, I, I it just, does I just don't see the connection. Well, there. and they searched everything. Right. And didn't find anything. And they searched immediately. I mean, they were over there fast. Yeah. But, you know, so maybe not with them, but perhaps with somebody else that Sophia knew. And I should be clear that police are still saying even with this information, that they don't believe anyone in Sophia's immediate family had anything to do with her disappearance. So this isn't making them like relook into grandpa or anything like sure. that. But she could still be out there. Well, yeah. Video is crazy. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, if that's actually her, that's, that's insane. Absolutely. I mean, I, Yeah. I, I, I don't even know. I, I It just blows my mind. So right now, in addition to getting a DNA sample from that woman in Mexico, police are focusing on the van. They want people to consider whether or not they knew someone in the area who had a similar van at the time who may have traveled in the Kennewick area as part of their regular route or routine. So, you know, they're looking, they're asking for people to not just concentrate on, you know, people who had a van like that who may have been in the area that night, just like people who like just generally would have been there if that was on their route. If this wasn't a member of her extended family mm -hmm. trying to get her back to Mexico, this would have to be the, 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 the luckiest abductor, child abductor in the history of the world. You know what I mean? To r run across a almost five-year-old girl like walking down the street by herself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it just it seems it seems almost like like it couldn't have been a total random occurrence. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just so hard, especially when you look at how fast the police response was. But we've seen that before in even more rural areas with a fast police response and there's just no trace of the person left. Yeah. And I guess what, what where I'm going is like, so this is obviously a team event. Yes. So you, and ha so you have, you have a, a, a child. Right. Uh, you know, regardless of what you said, 10 or 11. 11 to 14 was the estimate. Okay. So a child. But maybe somebody older because they said so they said Unusually that the child had hands. yeah but a baby face yeah. so it could have been an older teenager sure. who just looked young yes okay but again uh, still uh, but, but a, yes either a, a way kid. police police do not believe that this kid whoever he is 
decided to just kidnap Sophia. Right. And that's, they, that's my point. Is exactly. That, so now you're dealing with a team that has mm-hmm. a, a kid who's been groomed mm-hmm. to aid in abducting children who happen to be on a street when randomly Sophia is walking down the street by right. herself to meet up with grandma's boyfriend. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, like you're right. I, I think that you're is, right. This is too much. The Again, odds of it are even crazier than if it was just one crazy guy. Yes. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. So, so like looking at the Morgan Nick case where, you know, she got separated and the guy in the red truck right. pounced. Yes. But you're right. I mean, having a team just happen upon this random occurrence right. because again, I mean, this is a very random evening occurrence. It's not something that Sophia normally did. It's not a time that a, an almost five year old would typically be out walking. Yeah. And getting back to, to the Morgan Nick thing, it was mm-hmm. also during a, a little league game or yeah, was a little it, league yeah. game. So that person was hunting Right, because there were a because billion were kids, kids there. there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is again a random occurrence. Yeah, like she's walking down the street from her home, mm-hmm. where no event is occurring. Yeah. So again, if that team of kidnappers, and I want to say it was like a Tuesday night too. Yeah. Again, if that team of kidnappers just happened to be there, then they're the luckiest kidnappers in the world. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't see that. I, what, what I see is that the this was planned because if that's, if that's what happened, it had to have been planned to some extent. So, yeah. So how would it have been planned though? If, if Sophia changed her mind and decided at the last second to leave? I don't know. Yeah. I but don't, I, I don't know I, if there was some involvement. Yeah. I, I don't know. Again, I don't, do not believe in coincidences, and you can, it's like you can't. It can't and I do, but that one's that one's a little tough for me. Yeah, I mean, it, it cannot just be a coincidence yeah. that that this You're team right. of kidnappers was the just team. sitting on on the on the street where Sophia happened to be going past at eight thirty on a Tuesday night. He led her to the van. It wasn't a violent abduction. Yes, which means they were set up to kidnap somebody. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I think even more than that, even though she was was crying, it seems like she would have known him to some extent, right? Because, I mean, I feel like if he was a total stranger, he was just leading her to the van in a way that didn't make a witness think that something was too wrong. Well, yeah, but you know, you never know what he he could have said something like, come with me, your mom got hurt or something like that. You know, I'm a friend of your family and your mom... Yeah. got into a car accident. You know what I mean? Like they could say uh, any number of things. This is a five-year-old girl. Yeah. You know, uh, any five-year-old, if, you know, they hear somebody saying, hey, I'm a friend of your mom's or uh, I'm just throwing that out there. You no, know, I, no, but, I, I but get what could, you're saying. You're right. You're easily right. Be, they could very easily be manipulated and scared at the same time right. and then start crying, but also go along with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, these people are master manip- manipulators. That's, that's how they abduct kids. So, but again, you know, it just, it just seems like it seems crazy to me that it was that, that if that's what happened, that mm-hmm. it, it was just circumstance. That's a good point. And I, yeah, I didn't think of this being a team aspect, especially a team with a child as making it less likely that it was a complete coincidence you right. know, a crime of opportunity type thing. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, I think it especially because it does involve a minor. I mean, if it was two just like dirt bags driving Adults. around, yeah. then I could I could buy it a little bit more. It would be less difficult for me to just think that two dudes could agree to do this at the spur of the moment. You're right. I, I think a, a, for a child to be involved like that, he would have had to have been groomed and it does... Yeah, it doesn't seem like something that they were just passing by on their way to the movies or whatever yeah. and decided to just abduct a five-year-old on right. a whim. Again, if if that's what occurred. Yeah. Because we don't know. We don't know. I mean, the police do say that this witness is highly credible. And, you know, again, they've they've known this from the very beginning and they still think that this sighting is credible enough that they're releasing the information 18 years later because they do believe 
this is what happened. Yeah. The headline said, like, detectives believe they know <laughs> what happened to her. Like, police believe that that is what happened, that this child led her into a waiting van. And so I guess, you know, what happened after that is really the part that we need to figure out. Like maybe the harm befell her or maybe she's in Mexico. Kennewick police have started a website dedicated to bringing Sophia home. It's linked on our blog. And on it, they are asking for the public to submit any information they may have, no matter how insignificant it may seem. They say, quote, somebody out there knows what happened to Sophia or at least has suspicions about someone that may have been involved. Now is the time to come forward and help bring answers to Sophia's family, end quote. Sofia Lucerno Juarez has been missing from Kennewick, Washington since February 4th, 2003. She was three feet tall and approximately 33 pounds. She had black hair and brown eyes. She was missing her top four front teeth at the time of her disappearance and had pierced ears. She was one day away from being five when she was abducted. She would be 23 today. If you have any information about what happened to Sophia Juarez, please contact the Kennewick Police Department at 509-628-0333. You can see all of the sources for this episode, along with photos and videos, at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG Pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.